Sammy Davis Jr., the demon, sees a chance to get out of the furnace room if Christopher Lucifer Lee will just let him convince Jack Klugman to sign over his soul. Also, Adam West plays a jerk. What, the H-E double hockey sticks? Rick Brooks and Mike Kogel as they explore the TV of the 70s and 80s through hand-picked episodes of their favorite and not-so-favorite series. Welcome to Battle of the Network Shows. I'm Mike. And I'm Rick. Hello, everyone. And we're doing another TV movie this week. We did one last season, and this is another star-studded TV movie, too. It certainly is. Cast, you, you can't believe all these people worked together in one, one movie. So this one is, well, before we get to that, I think Rick wanted to say, give a thank you to one of our listeners. Yes, we had a great uh, email through our mailbag at Battle of the Network Shows com address. Welcome anybody to give us feedback and maybe request things that you'd like to see us cover on the show. But uh, anyway, friend of the show, James Belanger, wrote in. He particularly liked our Saturday Night's Main Event episode we did a couple seasons back, but he said some very nice things about the show and even suggested, Mike, that maybe we could do another uh, pro wrestling themed episode in the future. Be careful, James. <laughs> Now, you might think, hey, we did Saturday Night's Main Event. That's 1980s WWF. That, that's wrestling, right? Well, <laughs> we've got NWA Wrestling, AWA Wrestling, World Class Championship Wrestling, Georgia Championship Wrestling, uh, Mid-South Wrestling. Anyways, we got a lot of episodes we could do, but James was so nice. He sent, uh, sent us a couple of t-shirts, and one was kind of a wrestling theme shirt, which is very cool, and love that. And right now, I happen to be wearing the Batty Mania shirt. Very classy. Yes, uh, reminiscent of uh, a certain phenomenon in the 1980s, uh, wrestling-related. But uh, the style is, is quite similar, shall we say. But I think it looks uh, pretty good, uh, if I do say so myself. So thank you uh, very much for that. And also, what I think is a genius idea, you might say, a uh, Pinamania shirt. Yeah, that's that's uh, pretty amazing. That is one of a kind, as well as this Batty Mania shirt, I'll tell you that. Yeah, once you can walk around in public again. <laughs> I look forward to you walking around in public in these. <laughs> oh, I, I'm going to, uh, and I'll wear it proudly. You know why? Because all the piney maniacs, brother, they're out there saying their words of wisdom. They're drinking their lawn brows and they're eating their steaks, brother. What you gonna do when the piney maniacs run wild on you? Uh, join them? Yeah, there you go. I think that'd be a great course of action. Okay. Especially if they got steaks with loading, bro. Yeah, how about it? So we got Pina Mania going, Batty Mania, and I'm always down for celebration of 1980s wrestling. So thanks again, James, for sending us the, the cool stuff. We appreciate it very much. Appreciate you listening, and anybody out there, you don't necessarily have to send us stuff, but uh, it'd be cool if you did, but, you know, come uh, give us some feedback on the show, listen, download. Uh, most importantly, maybe tell your friends, uh, anybody you think would be interested in our podcast and, and interested in 1970s and 1980s television. Uh, give us a listen. You can check our official YouTube page. Uh, go to us at BattleOfTheNetworkShows.com or join us in our Facebook group uh, where we have uh, some good people that really enjoy talking about this stuff and, and kind of going into some things that we talk about in the show and uh, even often some other tangents and directions. So come join us there. We'd love to have you. And I, I think that about covers it. Yeah. So the, this movie we're going to talk about today, it's called Poor Devil. And I heard about it just in passing on uh, the Word Balloon podcast, which is a Mostly a comics podcast, but also some pop culture. But the host, John Suntress, was talking to comics writer Matt Fraction. And Sammy Davis Jr. comes up a lot when they talk. And he told Matt Fraction about this movie and said it was on YouTube. And uh, it's from the early 70s, and uh, Sammy plays a demon. There you go. Enough said, right? <laughs> yeah. Christopher Lee plays Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Jack Klugman plays the sort of uh, second lead, I guess. And Adam West plays a heel. Yeah. And then there are a couple other people, but uh, those are the main characters, and just those four people. This certainly rivals Pray for the Wildcats for awesome cast, I think. It holds its own, for sure. Yeah. It definitely does. And I guess, I, I didn't find a lot of information, but that this was a pilot. One of those pilots that never, that just aired as a movie and never got made. But once we get into it, I, I honestly can't imagine this being a TV series at all, but. 
it seems like one heck of a concept for, well, one heck of a concept. Yeah, for a weekly series, right? That's amazing. But yeah, this was essentially a failed pilot. Really, the idea of Sammy Davis Jr. wanting to do a regular series seems odd to me. But maybe in the 70s, he was a little, I guess he, you know, it was around the time he got divorced and was, uh, you um, know, exploring Satanism and drugs yes. and and pornography i'm not sure what that means exactly in in his context i just saw that in wikipedia it was a list of the things that he mentioned in his biography that he explored well i assume i i'm gonna just assume it was a viewing and not anything else but the man had an interesting life and uh was involved with uh perhaps some elements of shall we say organized crime with his long association in las vegas and he did explore satanism and and drugs and but perhaps the bottom of the barrel was exploring weekly network televisions so, but <laughs> right. i think we can forgive him for that but i read about this in um an excellent book that you actually got for me made for tv mayhem by amanda reyes covering a lot of the television movies of the era and there was a, a little bit about this even though it was a pilot but it aired as a movie and according to that book sammy davis jr was actively looking for uh, a television spot just before this in 1973 he had been on a he had been the host of a show called nbc follies which was kind of an old school weekly variety show and and, you know, they'd have guests like, you know, Mickey Rooney and Don Rickles and that and Sammy Davis Jr. doing uh, performances. And he was, I think, the story is he was looking for something. He, he was interested in a regular TV series role. Later in the 70s, he had a, a show, I think it was like Sammy Davis and Company. It was like a syndicated variety show that he did. It was a weekly show that don't hear too much about anymore. But I guess he was comfortable with the idea of doing regular television. And also interesting to me is that Christopher Lee was. And I think Christopher Lee saw this as a way to maybe get into the increase his stardom in America. He had been in the you know the Hammer Horror movies famously, and now because of his roles in multiple epic franchises, he may be more of a household name in this country. But I think in the early '70s it might have been a little bit different, and he saw this as a way: hey, I can get a good gig in the United States and make some more money, and yeah, be in a, a regular series. I thought that was interesting too. Yeah, and of course, Adam West was uh, a few years down the road from Batman, and probably looking for some uh, different casting. Yeah, he was probably finding. You know, typecasting uh, and, and being associated with Batman was probably really finding it a hindrance. So I would think he would be glad to get this kind of role. Yeah, and Klugman seems a little against type too. Well, he's... I mean, in, in the sense that he's hes playing a little bit of a schlubby guy. Yes, and he's revealing his natural hair. Yeah. Which is interesting. Yeah, it, at this time, well, this is right around the time of uh, Odd Couple. And I think Klugman and West... Uh, I mean, I'm assuming that a lot of these characters, except Sammy Davis and Christopher Lee, everybody on the non-hell side <laughs> would probably uh, change over. But yeah, it was it was uh, kind of a mostly subdued character that Klugman's playing. Yeah, uh, he, no, he doesn't really even get all that angry. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, he's so well, well identified with Oscar Madison and uh, Quincy, but it's easy to forget that he was in a lot of, he was in multiple Twilight Zone episodes playing different characters. He was in, you know, a lot of like Playhouse 90, kind of stuff like that. So he, he did have uh, a, a diverse career before Odd Couple as well, but yeah, it yeah. does stand out, this performance. Like in 12 Angry Men, he's very soft-spoken, that character he plays. Yeah. And of course, he's the young guy. Anyway, uh, a great cast and uh, rounded out by um, Gino Conforti, which is a name I know, and yet when I was looking at his credits, like nothing stuck as something. It just, maybe Gilbert Gottfried mentions in a, a right. lot, I don't know. I think he's a favorite of theirs, and uh, you know what I remember him most from is playing Felipe on Three's Company. Right, yeah, and, and that was was he the like the chef at the? He worked with uh, Jack, and and I think they were always at at odds with each other. Seems like the kind of character he <laughs> plays just based on this. Yeah. And then uh, Madeline Rue as Klugman's wife, and again that name seems familiar, but I guess she was on the later some of the later episodes of Murder She Wrote as a recurring character. Yeah, I, I found that interesting. I think she was a librarian, and she had multiple sclerosis. And the story is that Angela Lansbury arranged for her to get that recurring role because she was in danger of losing her health insurance wow. because she didn't have enough like screen credits, and she was finding it harder to get roles. So through the inter intervention of Angela Lansbury, they created that role for her, and that helped her you know, retain her, her status enough to get health insurance and just be a working actress. So good for Angela Lansbury. Yeah. A lot of people might remember her from Space Seed, the episode with uh, that introduced Khan in Star Trek. Uh -huh. Ah, okay. So this movie, yeah, it's from 1973. 
and when did it air? One thing that's interesting, I, I do have this, and I find this very interesting. It aired February 14th, 1973. Yes, it was it was a Wednesday, and yes, it was Valentine's Day. So we have a, a movie that might seem to have a Halloween theme taking place in the Christmas at Christmas time, airing on Valentine's Day. So that definitely kind of feels like, okay, it's unsold pilot where... <laughs> We're burning off, right? Yes. And it was on NBC, and uh, would you like to know what else was on uh, TV that night? I always do. Well, NBC is probably the most interesting because it had Adam-12 and then Poor Devil. So this was a TV movie in a 90-minute time slot. So it was Adam-12, Poor Devil, and then at 10 o'clock, BOTNS favorite Search. Oh. Yes, although this is one of the Tony Franciosa episodes. Yeah, they're okay, too. So, yeah. So, uh, Search was on this night in 1973. So, you know, quite a night of, of television there. Yeah. ABC countered with uh, The Paul Lynn Show and another of these 90-minute television movies, The Girls of Huntington House, which I'm not familiar with that, but it might have been an unsold pilot as well, followed by Owen Marshall, Counselor at Law, and guest star Robert Reed was on that, happened to be on that episode. He's popping up quite a bit uh, on Battle of the Network shows lately, isn't he? Wow, and guest starring while Brady Bunch was still on. That's right. And CBS had the Sonny and Cher Comedy Hour, Medical Center, and Medical Center had uh, as a special guest star Earl Holloman. Oh. Who we know from, uh, of course, Chips and his uh, charity work with uh, actors. Actors and people. Actors and other people. Other people. For for animals. For animals, (laughs) yes. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> Rounding off the night for C- uh, CBS was Canon. Oh, Canon. The, the great William Conrad. Canon. So just hearing kind of those shows, this this feels like, okay, we're we're 1973, kind of early, mid-70s, and that's that's the context for, for Poor Devil. So in a way, I mean, did it seem to you that this movie opened with like like a 15-minute scene? I mean, it really there, did. It was sort of like two locations, but in one of them they were watching the other location on TV, basically. So <laughs> yeah. it just... <laughs> Right there, that's uh, interesting in its own right. But so it starts with we see Klugman. He's in a car. He's watching this department store. It turns out the city of Paris in San Francisco. And we then he's bumbling about trying to break in. He's trying to use a grappling hook to climb, and it gets caught in his trunk and like smashes his windshield. Yeah, and, you know it's not going well. And then we kind of zoom out, and we're on this just TV framed by red, and it turns out that they're in, in the lobby of hell. Yeah. <laughs> They're watching him. Right. On one of the TVs in the lobby, or our monitors, they say. And uh, um, and this young woman, Chelsea, who's uh, wearing, you know, red, clearly works there, is, you know, kind of watching that with interest. But then you get these PA announcements about new people to hell, and you see people sitting in waiting chairs and filling out clipboard forms and things. A lot of young people walking around. It seems like a kind of a hit place to work, actually. Yeah, and I mean, the, you know, the, the employees with their cool red clothes, and we see later, like, you know, big medallions and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's very uh, swinging 70s, I guess you'd call yeah. it. And, and I, you know, it's not maybe a new thing to see uh, sort of somewhere like this treated a little bit like, you know, given like a, a sort of like a business atmosphere covered in, in whatever design touches to make it feel like this. But it, it doesn't make a lot of sense that hell would be full of bureaucracy yeah <laughs> but there's there's like a veneer of professionalism though to it isn't there I mean, like like it seems kind of efficient and they have a bunch of people doing roles and yeah it's just kind of interesting except for like what sammy's doing which is like an interesting contrast so like sammy davis jr's character is also named sammy is doing like the stuff in hell that we sort of envision hell is like yeah he's torturing people no he's uh <laughs> <laughs> he's putting fuel in a furnace coal yeah. or shoveling coal yeah. into a furnace but he is wearing like a a red vest, and yeah. he's still he's still looking cool. Of Sammy? course. And Chelsea calls him up and tells him that this guy, Klugman's character, who we learn later is named Burnett Emerson. Yeah. Pretty cool name. Yeah. He's had his eye on, he, he's up to something, and she thinks this is, this is his time. He's right, and he might be able to get him to sign his soul over. So Sammy risks getting in trouble, more trouble with Lucifer, by going up to check this out. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing I, I want to mention, too, about the San Francisco setting with uh, Emerson here and, and the break-in, is I, I kind of enjoyed that, like, faux shaft uh, musical score during those scenes. Yeah. 
it, at first it almost seems like, oh, what are we watching here? And then when you kind of realize it, it, it kind of provides a, a funny contrast to, you know, Jack Klugman's actions, how inept he is at this. He's not at all like the cool, suave character that, like, Shaft is, for example. No. <laughs> and he's got, like, Coke bottle glasses. Yeah. And, and then also when uh, Sammy's going up, and maybe this is where they had the credits, but I, I just wrote down jazz flute because there's a lot of that sort of <laughs> um, yeah. kind of like, what is that? That, uh, you know, like that Quincy Jones song that, from that era that has the flute and stuff. I think it's... The theme song? Or the, yeah. Like, like the, the Ironside? Uh, not Ironside. Not Ironside, but like the thing they used in... You know, Austin Powers and that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Again, kind of more of that swinging vibe. Yeah, exactly. And as, as Sammy, while he's up there, he points out that, uh, or, or that, uh, or maybe Chelsea says it, but that when someone is desperate, that's when they'll sell their soul. Right. So he's trying to get in to see Lucifer, who he hasn't seen for 400 years, because he, quote unquote, mishandled the pilgrims. Yeah. But there's the uh, Gino Conforti character, Mr. Bly, won't let him in because he's... He's sort of the gatekeeper, I guess. Yeah, he's like kind of the classic middle management heel kind of character, right? Yeah, and he despises Sammy. Yeah. It's hell. You think everyone would despise everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's really got in for Sammy. And mentions that he, Sammy also thought Dr. Schweitzer was a, a, pros, a hot prospect. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of these jokes kind of fall a little flat. Actually, I don't know if it's the the setting or whatever, but just, it's just kind of weird. Like, there's there's some references to like historical events and everything. And yeah, now that you think, but like that, I mentioned that that almost seems like a kind of uh, what would you call it? A, like a Bob Hope kind of joke. Yeah, yeah. This guy uh, is a demon. And Sammy's the last <laughs> hot press prospect he <laughs> thought would be uh, Doctor Schweitzer. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I presume. Yeah. <laughs> This is the worst Bob Hope. <laughs> Maybe I can top it with a with even worse Sammy Davis, because like another example is that with the the, the thing with that Plymouth, you know, he says after you know how you handled you know Plymouth, and he, he just says something like, "Yeah, nobody told me they were supposed to land, man." I don't know if he says "man" at it, but he's he's just kind of like nobody told me they were supposed to land, you know, and it's it's he kind of looks away. It's just I don't know. There's just something about it. it just doesn't seem to work. Uh, and it, there's a couple of these references throughout the thing that to kind of remind you that he's been around a while. But yeah, now, later I think we he's been there, fourteen hundred years. But he's a demon. He's not a human that died. Yeah, he's an employee. Yeah, <laughs> and and and, and um, Bly even says like he thinks he belongs up there mm-hmm. with like a. This attitude. Yeah, a very contemptuous look on his face. But Sammy me- manages to get past him, and they both go in to talk to Lucifer, and uh, Sammy pleads his case, and the- they turn on a monitor there, and they're watching. So Emerson gets as far as to put dynamite on a safe and light the fuse, and then he <laughs> decides he doesn't. And, mm. and then it was a whole operation, too. He didn't have matches. And- yeah. And he decides he doesn't want it, and he's trying to stamp out the right. fire, and that doesn't work, and he ends up cutting the fuse with scissors. And yeah. and then a security guard comes in, and it turns out that he works in this place. Mm-hmm. And he's they, they have a file on him. He's been a junior accountant there for 25 years, which is a long time to be a junior accountant. Mm-hmm. For a single department store. And Lucifer seems to, uh, he's piqued his interest a little bit, I think. And, and then we see him at home with his wife, and, you know, he's just, he's, He's bothered. He didn't get a promotion. He didn't get any sort of gratitude for his 25 years, like a gold watch or whatever. Right, nothing. Yeah, and he's, he's really down about it. And his wife's supportive and everything. And they're in bed, and Lucifer says, you know, I do believe Mr. Emerson is getting ready. And Sammy's like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we turned off the screen? <laughs> For us. Yes. Because in order for any of this to start get, getting going, a person has to make a request. Yeah. That seems fair. Sure. There's rules in this universe that poor devil has created. They're, they're already esta- doing their world building early and establishing the rules. That's good. That's right. And there isn't a lot of legalese involved in this yeah. uh, world. Can I ask you a question here, Mike? Did you watch this on... Uh, I watched it on Prime Video. It's on Prime Video? It is on Prime Video, yes. Nuts. Oh, well... I watched it on YouTube. Okay. Very poor... Or iffy quality. The, the quality on, on the Prime Video is horrible. Uh, it's probably the same the same thing. It looks like a third generation VHS dub. This was a, definitely a VHS. Yeah, like it had blue at the beginning. Okay, it was it was not broadcast quality or anything. It was it was really poor, and we were watching it with the closed captions. Oh boy! 
they 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 were terrible. They they started out okay, but as like a few minutes in, you, you realize, oh no, we're in for it. They look like automated ca- uh, captions, wow. uh, no punctuation, yeah. and the audio got worse and worse. But one, I want to bring this up now because Emerson's or Bernie, his wife is Francis, but in one of the captions, he refers to her as fences. He calls her fences. So fences. for the rest of the movie, I thought of her not as Francis, but at fences. <laughs> And uh, that, that was probably my favorite in the whole thing, just imagining her, you know, fences. fences. I'll be home late tonight, uh, fences. Can I introduce you to my wife, fences? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting name. Yes. In addition, there were uncountable variations of Bernie being spelled, and sometimes it was burning, but it was spelled different ways. So, yeah, that was, uh, it, was it was terrible. I mean, to be honest, because his name is Burnett, like I wasn't, I would, I'm not even sure how I would spell Bernie right. there, but... I would choose a way. Yeah, there was there was no choice involved, I don't think. It was bad. Uh, now I got to get over that. So Lucifer is like kind of, he's warming up to this idea, and basically it's, it'll be Sammy's last chance though, if he gets to go up and try to get this contract. So uh, as they're watching, finally Emerson does say, I'd sell my soul to get a promotion, or get mm-hmm. that promotion. And Sammy immediately teleports to his bed. Then there's kind of like a great little funny scene, I thought, between the two of them where, you know, Klugman rolls over and he's there and he's like, I think you're in the wrong bed. Yeah. (laughs) Like that, yeah. Like he doesn't, he never panics or anything. Right. And they just have this back and forth facing each other. Yeah, keeping their voices hushed. Yeah. So they don't wake up fences. Right. (laughs) And finally, uh, you know, he's like, meet me down, or meet me in the living room. There was a joke about downs, like Sammy's like, I'm from downstairs. Yeah, you're from the Feldman's apartment. <laughs> it's not quite classic Klugman incredulous uh, response, but it's it's close. So then you know he thinks he's having a nightmare, and he goes down, and Sammy's there, and starts to make his pitch. And is, uh, as Klugman's warming up, he's like getting him to uh, teleport all around the apartment. Yeah, it was very impish because it was Sammy and <laughs> right. Like in different poses. Yeah, like lying under things. Yeah, reclining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lounging around like, hey. And the deal is he'll have seven years of good fortune, and then he'll die and have to go to hell. And we also get like a scene of back in hell of Lucifer reminiscing about the Garden of Eden and how tough it was to convince Adam. Christopher Lee intoning fruit with names with a great drama. Yeah, Christopher Lee sort of almost looking like Javier Bardem in uh, No Country for Old Men. Yeah, he's uh, very, that, uh, that hairstyle. And he's got a little bit of eye shadow. I mean, yeah. I mean, he's he's Lucifer, so saying he looks goth is weird, but he yeah. does. Yeah, it was an interesting look. I, I kind of think, too, that, like, it's not necessarily, you might expect, oh, oh how's Christopher Lee going to play Lucifer? But he's not really, he's holding back. I, I'm I'm, assu- I'm thinking maybe if it was a series, they would have had more places to go with him. So he was he was saving a lot, I think, in this movie. Right, yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting to watch, but he's not, it's not really a particularly hammy Lucifer or anything like that. No, and he doesn't have horns or anything. No. <laughs> he's got the... A red suit and a turtleneck. I'm not sure how I feel about him in a turtleneck. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> this season on Battle of the Network shows, Mike on turtlenecks. Yeah. Tune in next week. <laughs> then the, the next morning, he's on his way to work. Emerson mm-hmm. is, and of course, he takes a cable car to work because it's a movie set in San Francisco. Yeah, there's some good location shooting, actually, in this. Yeah, yeah. And Sammy's, you know, going along, trying to make his sales pitch. You know, he he, he tries to sell the idea that like hell is utopia, essentially. They don't have any war or disease or, fa- you know, any of the bad things, mm-hmm. except for being tortured. And, yeah, well, there's that. The heat. And also, like, the idea of, like, revenge. It's almost like for for this Emerson guy, the idea of having seven years of success. At first, it's not even, he's not even thinking of, like, the seven great years. He's thinking of the, the chance to get revenge yeah. on, uh, you know, the company and, and Crawford and West's character. Yeah, yeah. So like that's the, that's almost more important to him than yeah it's success like getting back for being snubbed and, and like the revenge is like the big thing right but he's still unsure I mean it does mean going to hell and, and dying and he's there's that sure. yeah <laughs> <laughs> he wants these things and then right after that we do we meet uh, Crawford played by Adam West and uh, very well I thought yeah <laughs> very oily and uh, yes unpleasant and he. He explains to, to Emerson that it's, you know, Christmas Eve is their biggest sales night, and he wants to have the books done so that they can compare it to what they do on Christmas Eve. And, of course, he's telling him this 
on the 23rd or the day? It is the 23rd already. I think right? it's the 23rd because we'll have to stay there that night yeah. to finish everything. Right. And, uh, you know, that's a huge burden. Yeah. Obviously. And, you know, as a, as a, uh, a nod to Christmas Carol, the boss of this company is named Marley. Mm-hmm. So that definitely is helping push him in the, that direction. But he still hasn't quite given in. And then he and Sammy ride around on the cable cars for three hours <laughs> yeah. discussing this. And it seems he's about ready to sign. Mm-hmm. So they're going up to the apartment. I guess he's going to do it there. And he opens the door and Crawford is kissing his wife. So he shuts the door and he's like, I, I'm going to go kill myself. Yeah. But then we go back, we go in and we see that in truth, Crawford is basically making a move on her that was unsolicited exactly let's say. Yes. and unappreciated unappreciated too she she slaps him and she tells him to get out yeah so she had called invited him there to talk about the promotion and try to get try to help her husband just by talking about this and he misinterpreted it just as something else and of course how could any woman be in love with that guy yeah and not be in love with adam west you know, so Sammy and Emerson are out in the street. and Yeah, Emerson lies down in the middle of the, like, waiting for a cable car to run him over. Yeah, seems like not the most efficient way to do it. But no. <laughs> and Sammy explains, again, that the, there's a revenge clause in there, and he finally agrees. He's finally there. Sammy doesn't have a pen. Yeah. I enjoy this because, it, unlike in the Brady household, we learn... <laughs> That uh, hell does not recognize handshake agreements. Ah, yeah, <laughs> right. So Sammy goes down, and he takes a pen, and he comes back. Showing again how he really isn't necessarily that great at this, that he, he didn't even have a pen on him. Right. And part of his sales pitch to Lucifer originally was like, this guy's like me. He's inept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's kind of right. Yeah. We also learn another rule, that if they fail to satisfy his, his wishes— that he gets his soul back in the contract. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, interesting clause in that, isn't it? Yeah, that's not in keeping with, I think, these kind of stories usually. No, it's very... Like, usually there's a clause, a hidden, you know, there's fine print in there somewhere that's going to doom the person who signs it. Yeah, this is language that really protects the person that's selling their soul. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of, it's kind of admirable, <laughs> really. I mean, that... Right. It's quite a clause. It really guarantees that that person is going to have seven great years. Yeah. Or if, if it's not, it's their own fault. No, maybe that's punishment enough. I don't know. Getting everything you want for seven years? Yeah, I don't know. This, yeah, this isn't O. Henry's poor devil, though. It's uh, <laughs> NBC failed pilot poor devil, so we don't quite get that angle on it. Although, Sammy gets some bad news. Like He thinks he's done his job. He's he's just got to sell the car. He doesn't have to. Yeah. <laughs> but it turns out he's also got to be the mechanic. Yeah. He has to service Emerson for seven years, which is disappointing because he's got a date that he's been waiting for for 400 years. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And it's supposed to start in the morning, but he's uh, Emerson's freaking out that night. And I really enjoy it, too, that he's like, you know, he's trying to, he's just calling out Sammy's name. Nothing's happening. He's like, sure, the, the Church of Satan downtown will know how to call them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was kind of cool. And he picks up the phone to call them. Yeah. Uh, and isn't, uh, in the scene where uh, Sammy finds out that he ha- he's going to be the one responsible for carrying out his wishes, isn't that... Where he does like a little uh, bubbly spit take, where he's he's, he's raising a, a drink, you know, and then when, he, when he's told, "Oh, well, you're the one that's going to have to," he kind of does the thing where he kind of like gurgles his drink. He doesn't actually spit it out like Danny Thomas. He, he does a little like dribbles it out yeah, back into the yeah, glass. Yeah, yeah. I, I rather enjoyed that. I, I just wanted to, to highlight that too. Yeah, that was good. So what he, he's come up with his plan for vengeance, though. Yes, Bernie has. Yes, which is because it's going to be. Christmas Eve to steal every single item in the store so that there's nothing there when yeah. they open. Which at first I'm like, well, why? Why is Sammy making a big deal about this? That's not hard to do. But it turns out that Sammy doesn't really have much power. Isn't you know other than teleporting, he can't yeah. do anything up here. That's a little disappointing, but yeah, yes, yeah, so that makes it reasonable why he would even like care about what the plan was. Yeah, because he's got to worry about how to carry it out, and he doesn't have like omnipotent powers. Right. Yeah. So he, he goes back to hell to strategize yeah. with a collection of some of the greatest criminals in history. Yeah, this was an interesting scene. He's got like, it's kind of like an executive boardroom kind of set. Yeah, he's got Al Capone and a couple of hangers on. Yeah. The Younger Gang mm-hmm. and Bonnie and Clyde and Blackbeard. Yeah, what a group. Yeah, that seems like the, the, the greatest criminals of the last hundred years or something. Not so much yeah. all history, but... Yeah, he couldn't have gotten, like, Genghis Khan or somebody, or... 
Seems like there would be a lot of. Uh, it would have been harder to retrieve some of those older ones. I don't know. Yeah. He's got a bit of a time crunch. Right. And they all give advice that is dated. It's yeah. It's whatever, based on whatever they are interested their in. Their own experiences, right. So Al Capone's like, well, you got to ram a truck through the window, <laughs> yeah. through the store. It's got to be full of booze yeah. and. You gotta have two people on running boards. Yeah. And they have have to have choppers. And you're gonna like it, see? (laughs) And the youngers are like, it's all about family. You're trusting your personnel. Yeah. And Blackbeard is like, you gotta have a place to hide it. An island in the Caribbean. Yeah. (laughs) Something about his treasure being buried under a Hilton. And then Bonnie starts to read a poem, which I guess is a Bonnie and Clyde thing. I don't Yeah, you know, I I didn't really think this scene worked. Could have been a good scene. Yeah. It, it had the potential, but yeah, I think you're right. The performers didn't really stand out. The their their dialogue didn't really stand out to me. I just didn't. It seemed like a little bit of a missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. So Sammy talks to Chelsea, and she was like, "Well, can you take it and modernize what they're saying?" And well, choppers. Hmm. Now that means helicopters. Yeah. Like oh, an island, and he's like, "Oh, they There's... do have an island." Yeah. Alcatraz. There you go. Well, although really, those two elements are. It's, I guess, the personnel thing, too. He figures out. He doesn't say that, but he figures out. But he gets all these other people who have signed their souls over to help out. So they have, like, an army of people to rob this for. Yeah. I'm going to say, like, up to this point, I pretty much enjoyed the movie. (laughs) Like, yeah. And then this whole last bit got a little bit tedious. Yeah, there's, like, this this stealing montage of, of like, everybody, like, picking stuff up and then, like, the the human chain to get it onto the helicopters. Right, which I don't know. Do they have one helicopter? Do they have a bunch? Because the helicopters are not. These aren't big, like, you know, military cargo helicopters. Yeah, and going back and And forth. And they're still, like, beds and things. (laughs) Yeah, it it made it look like there was just one helicopter at a time. Uh, Yeah. Or that they had to keep reusing. It just kept coming back really quickly. but Right, uh, but it wasn't all that. I mean, they tried it, like, they're kind of, like, doing that thing where they're speeding it up and everything but it just didn't it wasn't all that visually compelling to me yeah and it just had that feeling of these kind of things sometimes have like well if we just do something chaotic quickly yeah it'll be funny yeah yeah kind of a forced wackiness and even i think like the music it just seemed like 1960s contrived yeah speeding things up for its own sake and and hoping that it'll come out and something funny and it didn't really didn't really work that much yeah I mean, this kind of thing would be, like, it's the kind of thing, like, you could see it being, like, a 45-second a, a sequence on, like, a Gilligan's Island. Yes. It would work, but it seemed to go on a lot longer than 45 seconds here. Right. And this movie is only, what, an hour and 13 minutes? Something like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But, I, I mean, there are a couple of good jokes, like, Bernie runs into his father-in-law there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no wonder he has a new car every year. Yeah. That was good. I like that. Yeah. They managed to finish it all. And we also see Crawford, a brief scene of him leaving Marley's. And Sammy gives, as an appreciation, he gives uh, Bernie a gold watch, the gold watch he never got. Right. And, uh, you know, it's a nice gesture. And I believe Bernie says, you're a nice guy. Yeah, they like each other. But he's like, yeah, don't say that. He he might be listening. Yeah. (laughs) But Bernie realizes that this won't just hurt Crawford and Marley. It'll hurt uh, all his coworkers and all the people coming there to shop. You know, kids might not get what they wanted for Christmas because there's nothing there. Yeah, he's moping about it. Yeah. You're really having second thoughts. And then he's like, bring it all back. (laughs) And he has to. It's his contract. Yep, yeah. So... They just, I don't think they played everything in reverse, but it feels that way. Yeah. So we get to see a putting everything back montage. (laughs) Yeah. Now, what saves that, I think, is that by that time, Crawford, somewhere in between there, he came by the store, he saw naked mannequins, he went in and saw that everything was gone, and so he went to the police. Mm -hmm. But he'd had a few drinks with Marley, so they just think he's drunk and it's delayed and everything, so you're waiting, are they going to get this done in time for him to come back? Which they do, barely. With a little help from Lucifer, who's finally... Because of extenuating circumstances, he throws a fire hydrant in front of the cop car. Yeah. Also, I want to point this out because it's more evidence of the fact that this just really doesn't work as a whole, is that there's a spectacularly ill-aged rape joke in the precinct. Oh, when yeah. there, There's a woman who's been accosted, you know, and uh, they just they just sort of talk about it and... and the, the essence of it is that, you know, they, they, they need to find the person attacked. And she's like, boy, I hope they do find him. You know, I want to see him again or something like that. And yeah. It just, it doesn't play off. It, it, even even um, in 1973, I don't think that, that worked very well. It's just not, it's not well done. And, of course, Crawford is very dismissive of her anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even before that. I mean, I guess they're vague about what kind of assault. But then when she says that, it's like, oh. 
Like before they, she was assaulted in her park. Yeah. It could be a mugging or something. Yeah. yeah. Like Ruth Buzzy and Lathan or something like that character. Yeah. It's sort of that, but played like, it, it just played more pathetically and it just kind of like really like stands out, you know, like, like, uh, okay. It just, to me, it's, it's another thing that just doesn't work in this, like the comic element of it. So now that I've brought down this, this episode to, right. <laughs> to Carl. But we do get a funny scene of Crawford and the cops coming in and seeing everything there. Yeah. You know, them dragging him out and him doing yeah. the classic kind of. I'm not sort of comedy, I'm not crazy kind yeah. of thing. And yeah, like sputtering and yeah. Yeah. And then the next day when Bernie comes to work and one, he's happy to see all the people there lined up and everything and every, and then he comes into the office part where he works and his coworkers and his wife start singing for He's a Jolly Good Fellow and Marley's there and gives him the watch and gives him a promotion. Very warm uh, reception for him. Hey, he seems like a, a very nice man. Yeah. <laughs> And he explains that while the 17th was uh, the day he got hired, the 24th was his first official day. Yeah. So this is his 25th anniversary. Yeah. Oops. So it seems like, at the very least, he would have gotten the watch. He might have gotten the promotion because of what happened, mm. because Crawford is on a uh, leave of absence. Yes, his doctors recommended he take some time off, I guess. Yeah, but it almost seems like, well, this would have happened anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did, I had the same feeling that that, that was... He was in line for, I, I don't think, I don't know what they would have done with Crawford, but it seemed like he w- was in line for it. That the way it plays out, yeah, it wasn't like purely connected to, to Crawford leaving. So I don't know. And Fences is there too. And she seems, you know, has, has known about this, I guess. Right. At least since like, like the she, night before. I, I guess she. He called her to tell her to be there. And she doesn't know. She's like, maybe me having Crawford over helped. And then she explains what happened to him, and they have a good laugh about that, yeah. which is nice. But then Sammy reveals, I guess this is the catch of the contract, that Crawford says something like, well, we'll be together, you know, after she dies and all that. And he's like, well, no, you won't, because she's scheduled to go up there. And Emerson's like, well, oh, if I would known that, I wouldn't have yeah. done this. So at that point, like, Sammy, his niceness gets the better of him, and he realizes that Emerson still has the watch on, and so he didn't fulfill the contract. And yeah, he points it out to him, yeah. And so back to the furnaces, Sammy goes. Well, he does get a coffee break with his, with Chelsea. Yeah, although he, he has, they make several references throughout the movie about him going back to shoveling, and you know how he, he dreads that, and he doesn't want to spend, you know, umpteen hundred years doing it, but that's that's his, uh, his fate here, at least at the end of this episode. Right, so... I, I just don't get how this would work as a series. I mean, it's it's like a reverse highway to heaven. Yeah, <laughs> right. But So he would have to be constantly trying to prove himself by recruiting souls. There's clearly meant to be like a big comic tone running through it, so you couldn't get too heavy with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, like, and I mean, he's Sammy Davis Jr., so he's likable. It's easy to root for him in that sense, but I don't want him to succeed at having people go to hell. Right. If he does well, somebody's sold their soul to the devil and— faces eternal damnation yeah or like on highway to heaven or touched by an angel right you're helping them become better people and or in some cases literally go to heaven at the end but especially highway to heaven i think was helping people become better people yeah and if he fails then well you're just seeing him screw up time and time again every week yeah that's probably not appealing either. now that i think about it, you know the one thing that maybe they could have retooled it is play up on the angle with him and gino conforti Mr. Bly and have Christopher Lee character makes only rare appearances and Gino Conforti is sort of working against what Sammy Davis Jr. is doing so that there's elements of and actually like in the movie near the climax there Christopher Lee puts up a an obstacle right to slow up you know the police so maybe he would get it so there's precedent there for them get, getting involved from hell I, I think that's the only way you could do it is have the the main conflict be between sammy davis jr and gino conforti trying to foil his efforts so that it's not just sammy davis jr screwing up but somebody else like sticking it to him and him trying to work around that yeah even then it's yeah. ludicrous of course but right i mean if you take the hell aspect out of it, it it's fine i mean in terms of what the conflict is and you're you want this guy to succeed at his job and that and that but then you throw in hell, and, and it's well, like, well, that's weird. Is the great Paul Williams once saying, and that's the hell of it. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, that, yeah. that is the hell of it. Maybe once you take that out, what is there? Now, if there had been a series, I'm sure there would have been, A, an episode, uh, much like Year at the Top, yeah. involving Rockstar, and hopefully it would have been Paul Williams. Oh, that would have been great. And just to see Sammy and Paul Williams standing, facing each other. Yeah. Who's taller? Who's, <laughs> <laughs> who's hipper? 
that that alone might have justified like a, a series order. But yeah, I mean, and in, in, in we're assuming yeah, it would be like a guest star of the week, guest star of the week, one story per episode. But yeah, maybe they could have explored other aspects of hell. Yeah. There could be fun things to do there. Like a workplace uh, sitcom or a workplace comedy with based in hell. Right, which it feels like a little bit. Yeah. And there is, you know, they do set up those parallels between Sammy and Bernie in terms of job satisfaction. Yeah. You know, or, or maybe it's a thing where Sammy gets out of hell and is kind of on the run. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to chase him down and uh, yeah, bring him back. Uh, yeah. I don't know what uh, did you notice the uh, the song at the end? I kind of enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah. that was kind of cool. It's a weird p- place to put it, but and you know I don't know why you would have Sammy Davis Jr. in a thing and not have him sing the theme song. Yeah, but I did enjoy it and it was and catch all the words, but they were had something to do with. I mean, they were based on the the thing. Yeah, the movie. Wasn't there something about you're a saint when it comes to sinning or yeah, something yeah. like that? I think that's like the last line. Like, like that. And again, it seemed like a little, just maybe a couple of years behind that the style of that song. It, it was very odd. Yeah, everything was a little bit. Yeah. W- one thing I want to mention, too, during the, that great mass theft scene is they put the security guard out. And I like that, that Sammy Davis Jr., he was unconscious or sleeping. Emerson was worried about that. He's like, oh, I just put him out with some knockout drops. You know, one thing you, we don't necessarily miss these days is outdated sexual assault jokes one thing i do miss is jokes about knockout drops fortunately the two don't intersect and you know we haven't gotten to to bill cosby in it yet yeah. but i just love that notion knockout drops that's something you don't hear about anymore and like, right i've always been you know fascinated like by there's that. something you buy it yeah like they come in a box or something just for that purpose <laughs> he's so casual well, i just gave him some knockout drops yeah <laughs> So I did enjoy that. That's one of the things that worked. And like, so what do you think? Like other things that worked, I think the cast was was really good. Everybody was enjoyable in their roles in this. Yeah, and I think Sammy and Klugman together were really good. Yeah, you know, I think a little bit of Gino Conforti went a long way. I, I agree with that. I, I thought of that uh, as Felipe. <laughs> think of that as Mr. Bly too. But he, it is good casting for that kind of role. I mean, I think he did it well. They just there's a little bit too much. Of it. Yeah, and Adam West was great and. Like I said, I, I, you know, I laughed a good deal in the first half of it or so, and then yeah. it just sort of got tedious. I enjoyed Madeline Rue as Fences. Didn't have a whole lot to do, but she was good in it, and the Chelsea character was fine. Um, the the one thing I can't really talk too much, I, I did like, as much as I like the location shooting, I can't talk a lot about the cinematography or some of the other technical aspects because the, the print we watched was so bad. Right. <laughs> Whatever we were, were seeing was not... Uh, I'm going to have to take a look at that and see if it is is any better than the... I mean, because the YouTube one was definitely low quality. Yeah, let me know. It's one of those things, like, when you turn it on, you're not used to seeing that kind of thing on, on Prime or really any streaming service. Yeah. Be like, oh, is this... Uh, and then you can tell, okay, I don't know how this got up here. I'm glad it's up here. But I don't know who put this up, but it's uh like must it, be under the radar. It didn't have any, like, a film rise or something. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> if I recall correctly, it just started. And then later, it just ended. <laughs> So, yeah, it, not uh, pristine quality, but, but worth watching. An interesting curio. And, yeah, I think I think probably me, as much as the, the casting work, the writing didn't work for me. And I, there were parts of it, it seems strained even at, in this one, you know, 75-minute movie. And I share your concern about, like, how would this have sustained a series? But because I don't even think it worked all that well as, a, as an individual work. No, I don't think so. And usually, like, when they do a story like that, it's from the point of view of the person, the the dupe. Yeah. Like the, the devil in Max Devlin or, mm. oh God, you devil, or whatever. It, any version of the devil in Daniel Webster kind of thing. It's about the someone selling their soul and trying to get out of it. Mm-hmm. Whereas this, again, yeah, you're supposed to be rooting for the person. It's an offbeat concept. Person, yeah. I, I wish there were more... I wish there were more available about this because it, I have to think that there's some interesting stories that we haven't seen about the production of this and like the whole concept, but there's not a whole lot about it, like you said. I was trying to look up a little bit about the, you know, Sammy's dabblings in Satanism too. Mm. And because and, it, I, you know, like Eddie Murphy mentioned it on Comedians in Cars. Mm. So I think it got back in the pop culture a little bit there because <laughs> he was like, yeah, Sammy, you know, worship the devil. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I found this one story from 2018, possibly one of the worst pieces of journalism I ever saw. Wow. And it was from like a local news station or something. And the headline was, report reveals that Sammy Davis Jr. once 
attended the Church of Satan or something. That was the headline. And then the article was just like, a, report, a recently revealed report revealed that in his 1985 biography, Sammy Davis Jr. said that he, like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what kind of? A report? Yeah. What re- what you just have to go to the library? Was it a book report? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like some uh, some kid in high school wrote his uh, wrote a book report about Sammy Davis Jr.'s autobiography. <laughs> yeah, it's like, but it makes it sound like this official this secret that's come out and like, yeah. Well, if it was in his autobiography thirty five years ago, yeah, people already know. <laughs> they should. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't like there was a commission look, in, investigating. Right, that's a report by the commission of, oh, the Rat Pack Commission. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, Sammy. Did, uh. <laughs> After a thorough investigation, we have unearthed evidence in Sammy, Mr. Davis's autobiography. He also used cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> a new report reveals Sammy Davis Jr. enjoyed tap dancing. Yeah. Well, all kinds of revelations still coming out. Uh, maybe, I, I, maybe we should get Sammy Davis Jr.'s book and... <laughs> Find out maybe there's more. Maybe. Maybe there's more about Poor Devil in it. There's some detail. Yeah, I bet there's not. Probably maybe. not. Maybe. Who knows? It sounds like it was from the period where he was a bit down in the dumps about some things. So. Mm. This may not have been one of the high points of his career. He was hoping to get a series. It didn't work. I'm imagining that this didn't do all that well on Valentine's Day in 1973. No. I bet he didn't even care. He was probably out on a date. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Just wondering where what he was doing at the time, but... Mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll get a commission to look into that. <laughs> it's, it might be his autobiography. Yeah. <laughs> be great. I, actually, that would be enjoyable. Like, a, one of two paragraphs about that, and that one being written in, like, standard, like, ghostwriter ease. <laughs> like, yeah. On Valentine's Day, instead of watching my pilot movie, I found myself leaning over a sink at <laughs> Studio 54. <laughs> it's pretty dead. Studio 54, bro. <laughs> At the Copa. Yeah, Studio 53. <laughs> Snorting another line of cocaine with Dean Martin. <laughs> Whoa. I, I don't know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know that Dean ever did that. I don't know either, but that it's, it's like a stubborn uh, thing that just won't go away. Cocaine once again makes its way into Battle of the Network shows. <laughs> Third season in a row. Yeah. <laughs> I thought we might get away from it this time, but... <laughs> once, once, <laughs> once it's in... Uh, no, it's hard to get out. Well, you know, we can. We'll stop talking about it any time we want, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's podcasting about it. So, anything else? This, but well, poor devil. I don't know. But I'm. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you suggested it. I'm glad I watched it, but probably don't need to watch it again. Do you think this or Pray for the Wildcats captured middle class ennui better? <laughs> uh, probably Pray for the Wildcats. It seemed to capture that that a little bit more. This was a little bit too broad, maybe, and uh, yeah, it's some, some of the other the trappings, the the hell aspect of it, kind of distracted me. I think from the middle class ennui. <laughs> yes, the the hell ennui. Yeah, <laughs> wasn't that a wing song at the time? Hell ennui. Hello. Remember that? <laughs> right about this time. <laughs> What do you think? You, do, would you agree with that assessment? Or Yeah, that sounds about right. Although, I will say that parts of Pray for the Wildcats, some of those extended motorbike sequences made me feel like I was in hell, you know, sitting through those. This is true. That could be some people's uh, version of, of hell. Yeah, I'm really disturbed now, thinking about that again. Yeah, oh, sorry to take you back to that, that place. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, <you're... laughs> anyway, that's Poor Devil. Who knows what TV movie we'll find next season? Yeah, if you have so Rick's got a whole book of them, but I, I do. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of stuff, and yeah, with all kinds of failed pilots, premises that don't go anywhere. <laughs> but maybe eventually we'll come up with one that that works all the way through. Maybe I wonder if any did. <laughs> Well, uh, many call the 1970s the golden era of television movies. I'm not sure if we've proven that or disproven that uh, in the last couple of seasons, but I think we're going to keep going there because there's, there's all kinds of stuff to discover. Because uh, one thing is, like, until you brought it up, I this isn't, I don't think it's a more, it's a really famous thing. And, and these movies that we're covering, I had never even heard of before. So it, it's kind of cool to go back and, and look at an aspect of TV history that I didn't know much about. This episode brought to you by the City of Paris Department Store. They have everything you could ever need for a price. This episode also brought to you by the Candy Man. He can for a price. This episode also brought to you by Hell. They have everything you need for a price. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Battle of the Network shows. Learn more, leave feedback, 
and suggest future episodes at battlethenetworkshows.com. Follow us on Twitter at Batnet Shows and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Battle of the Network Shows.